Welcome and thank you for attending the Black History Matters series presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Victoria Basurto and I am a current senior at Colgate University located in Hamilton, New York, as well as an intern for the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum this year. I am very excited to be welcoming you to the first presentation of the series and would like to lead you to, through some introductory statements. Um, I will be facilitating the presentation of 28 videos that will be released throughout the month of February 2021 and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York, in the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Nehoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle and strive to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nehoff has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, which is also located in Peterborough, New York in the creation of the Black History Matters series. The following statement is the purpose of the Black History Matters series. You can read along on the screen. Nehoff supports racial justice movements seeking to address racial inequality, given the resonance with Nehoff's mission to address the second and ongoing abolition to end racism. Nehoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protests due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history, because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nehoff knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nehoff's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nehoff will present the Black History Matters series, a series of crash courses covering some examples of neglected topics in Black American history throughout the month of February, 2021. Thank you so much for joining me on the first presentation of the Black History Matters series. I will be introducing the series with a presentation titled The Beginning, 1619 through 1712. Um, you might have heard the date 1619 a lot on the news recently because of the New York Times initiative, which was created in 2019, um, which tried to reframe the way American history is taught and um, considering how slavery has had immense impact on American history as well as the contributions of Black Americans. The New York Times 1619 project has created numerous resources and teaching materials with the Pulitzer Center, which you can actually check out at pulitzercenter.org 1619. Um, this website will also be linked in the description, so don't worry if uh, you can't seem to find it. These standards for curriculum and resources have actually already been adopted by organizations and school districts like the Chicago public school system. The project has received a lot of criticism and backlash by people who claim it is historically inaccurate or unpatriotic, but such critique is always common when you try to change existing interpretations of history and you challenge the status quo in education. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, the creator of the 1619 Project, actually was awarded the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Commentary for her introductory essay to the series. Um, so definitely check out her essay. It speaks a lot to her experience as a Black American, as well as her decision to create the 1619 Project. One of the quotes that her essay opens up with, which I want to highlight here, speaks a lot to what um, Nehoff is trying to do with the Black History Matters series as well. It says, quote, our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. Black Americans have fought to make them true, end quote. And it speaks a lot to the idea that in order to understand um, the ideals of American democracy, like equality for all, we have to understand the institution of slavery and how that institution has always been antithetical to the idea of liberty for all and equality. So yeah, I highly suggest you check out the 1619 New York Times website and the Pulitzer Center if you wanna learn more about this topic. And again, these uh, sites will be linked in the description. So. If you um, just scroll down beneath the video, you can see them linked 
in that little box. Okay, so today we're going to try to understand how racism came to be a part of American, of American society um, by going back to the very beginning. A lot of the research that I use here for talking about the, the arrival of the first Africans to an English colony in 1619, I got from historian James Horn, who wrote an article about it on the American, on American heritage. And he is also the president of the Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation. Um, and he did a lot of research on this in his book, 1619 Jamestown and the Forging of American Democracy. So if you wanna learn more, feel free to check out his book. Um, but in, to, to get the ball rolling, in 1619, an English privateer ship called the White Lion landed in Point Comfort in the colony of Virginia after entering the Chesapeake Bay. The community it found at Point Comfort was a small maritime community whose position at the mouth of the James River made it the first port that ocean going ships would land in. The White Lion was carrying dozens of enslaved Africans, which it had acquired in the Caribbean, where it had, along with its companion ship, the Treasure, fought a Portuguese slave ship bound for Veracruz. Both privateer ships pillaged the Portuguese vessel and sailed northward, carrying dozens of captured enslaved Africans. The painting that you see on the screen is by Richard C. Moore, um, courtesy of Jamestown Rediscovery Foundation. It shows two English privateer ships, Treasure on the far left and the White Lion on the far right, fighting off the Portuguese ship San Juan Bautista, which is in the middle. The ships would go on to defeat the crew of San Juan Bautista and take the enslaved Africans north to Virginia where they would be sold. When the White Lion began to run short of provisions, it decided to land at the nearest English haven, which was the colony of Virginia in North America. Weeks after departing from Point Comfort, John Rolfe, a prominent planter of tobacco and someone who you might know as Pocahontas' husband, reported that the White Lion, quote, brought not anything but 20 and odd Negroes, end quote, who were sold to the colonists in order to afford to buy supplies. Um, the companionship treasure is believed to also have landed at the colony. Um, it left quickly, but it is possible that it clandestinely sold a couple of African captives itself as well. On the screen, you see an illustration by Howard Pyle, which depicts the sale of the first Africans in English North America at Jamestown in 1619. Before we move on to sort of the implications of this first arrival of Africans in, in an English colony, I want to speak a little bit about where these first Africans came from, because their identity should not just be that they were enslaved, but rather that they were people forcefully removed from their home and cultures. Um, these Africans came from West Central Africa, or what is now today known as Angola. The Africans had been taken prisoners during a joint African-Portuguese war in which the Portuguese combined forces with the Imbangala soldiers of Angola in order to defeat the kingdom of Ndongo. <clears throat> the joint offense took place between 1618 through 1619 and resulted in the siege of Ndongo, um, the capital um, known as Cabaza where the Portuguese captured thousands of Cabaza residents and then loaded them onto 36 different ships at the port of Luanda. The port, um, this port Luanda actually served as the center of the Portuguese slave trade. And these 36, ships, sh these 36 ships sailed across the world with enslaved people that were taking prisoners during this war. One of the 36 ships that sailed with prisoners, San Juan Bautista, would be the one that was intercepted in the Caribbean by the English privateer ships, the White Lion and the Treasure. And these would be the Africans that would be taken, captured, um, twice captured in a way, to the English colony of Virginia. And as I mentioned earlier, these would be the first Africans to arrive in mainland English America. Something that I found very interesting while doing research on this topic was that 1619 is actually also famous for another important event in the English colonies. Incidentally, at the same time that the year 1619 witnessed the beginning of the horrific institution of slavery, it was also the same year that the General Assembly met from July 20th to August 4th in the colony of Jamestown um, in order to create a representative governing body. 
Um, the General Assembly met from July 20 and August 4th, as I said, and was composed of the governor, four counselors, and 22 burgesses chosen by the free white men of every town, corporation, and large plantation throughout the colony. This gathering was instructed by the Virginia Company of London, and the meeting set out to create, quote unquote, just laws for the happy guiding and governing of the people. It is ironic then that the beginning of the democratic system and representative govern government in the future United States was paired with the beginning of the greatest atrocity um, and affront to freedom, the institution of slavery. As the historian Edmund Morgan wrote, quote unquote, slavery in the midst of freedom was the central paradox of the birth of America. The rapid expansion of opportunities for Europeans was made possible only by the enslavement and exploitation of African and Indian peoples. Non-Europeans were consigned to a permanent underclass excluded from the benefits of white society, while Europeans profited enormously from the fruits of the labors of those they oppressed." End quote. The image that you see on the screen is a reconstructed church at Jamestown, where the first democratic charter in North America was enacted in 1619. This is a reconstruction of the church done in 1907. And the reconstruction incorporates the brick tower of the church built on the site in 1639. It is one of the oldest architectural structures in North America. And photo credits go to Tony Fisher. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about how 1619 was the year that saw the first Africans brought to an English colony, as well as the moment where that system of slavery would begin at the same time as the establishment of the first governing body um, of representatives in the Americas. I also wanted to speak a little bit about the early resistance these enslaved Africans demonstrated in the wake of their enslavement. I think highlighting these early revolts of the enslaved is important because it emphasizes that these Africans were not passive victims um, and they did in fact do all in their power to combat the institution of slavery even when the, their success rate was not guaranteed. Um, so the revolt that I wanna briefly focus on is the 1712 slave rebellion in New York City. This is an important moment to speak about because it highlights the fact that although slavery is usually spoken about in connection to the South, there were enslaved people in the North and the exploitation of enslaved people was very much a part of the history of Northeastern cities like New York City. Um, just like it was a part of the history of the South. The New York Slave Rebellion of 1712 was instigated by 23 African-born slaves. Um, and before we move into sort of understanding, uh, going, going through the, the, the details on how the, the rebellion began, I think understanding the demographics of New York City is very important because the the place and location was very much a part of how this rebellion came to be. So the early 18th century, uh, early 18th century New York City had a large slave population of around 20%, 20% um, of the population was enslaved. And this number doesn't seem big, especially in comparison to um, islands on the Caribbean, for example, San Domingo, who witnessed a lot of slave rebellions because the population of the enslaved typically outnumbered that of whites on the islands. Santo Domingo, of course, would go on to have a revolution and would become the, the, the countries of Haiti and the Dominican Republic today. Um, in contrast, uh, New York City did not have a population of enslaved people that outnumbered that of whites, but it was still a very significant number, as 20% suggests. Um, and and the nature of the, of the layout of the city was also very much um, conducive to rebellion. So in the South, enslaved people lived mostly on large plantations and these large plantations made communication amongst the enslaved of different plantations difficult. Thus plotting a rebellion together was, was a, hard, a lot harder. Um, likewise, the work of enslaved people in the plantations often left little time for them to gather given the heavy workload they had. In contrast, however, Slaves in New York City worked mostly as domestic servants, artisans, skilled workers, or at the city docks. This meant that the enslaved people living in New York City interacted with each other more and were able to communicate easier. Not only did they communicate easier with one another, 
but they also interacted with few Black people, something that made them aware of the disparities between their con conditions. Um, again, the presence of free Black people was not common in Southern plantations. Thus, New York's demographics and layout made it possible for the enslaved to plan a conspiracy. The image that you see on this screen is a redraft of the Castello plan of New Amsterdam in 1660. Um, New Amsterdam, of course, being the name of um, the city prior to it being taken over by the English. And it, this image is sourced from the New York Historical Society Library. So the rebellions began on April 6, 1712, when a group of enslaved people set fire to an outhouse on, um, in Northern Manhattan. The fire formed from the arson signaled the beginning of the rebellion to other enslaved people. When the crowd of white people gathered at the burning outhouse, a band of 23 slaves fired at the crowd. The New York City governor, Robert Hunter, was warned and he sent the, in, he sent the militia to deal with the rebellion slaves. Some of the re uh, rebelling slaves ran and hid in a wooden swamp nearby in the north of the city, um, while the rest of them were captured. And before moving into some of the punishments that were given to those that were captured and, and tried, I wanted to speak a little bit about what the cause of the rebellion was, apart from the institution of slavery being um, arduous and difficult on the people that were enslaved. The rebellion was also cited as being as being um, a consequence of decreased freedom and status of the enslaved when the English took over the colony, uh, formerly known as New Netherland, um, in 1664 from the Dutch. When the Dutch controlled the colony, freed slaves had some legal rights like owning land and marrying. However, under the English, these um, liberties to freed slave for, to the freed um, people who were who were formerly slaves. Um, decreased, as well as under the English, new laws restricting the lives of enslaved people were implemented. Um, there were new laws that required slaves to carry a pass if they were traveling more than a mile. They were discouraged from marrying between themselves, and they were prohibited from gathering in groups of more than three, as well as required to sit in separate galleries at church. Additionally, new slave markets were created to allow for an increase in the importation of enslaved people by the Royal African Company meaning that the population of enslaved people in New York City was growing under the English. The culmination of the rebellion was a long list of casualties, eventual executions and punishments for the rebellious slaves. Um, the implementation of stricter laws for governing the enslaved also made life harder um, for the enslaved after the rebellion. At the end of the rebellion, nine whites had been killed and six had been wounded. On the side of the um, enslaved, six decided to commit suicide rather than await whatever punishments would be doled out to them. Of those that remained, approximately 40 were taken to trial, of which 18 were acquitted or pardoned. The remaining enslaved on trial were executed in brutal ways. Four of those sentenced to death were burned alive. Another was crushed by a wheel. One was made to starve to death while kept in chains and a pregnant woman was kept alive until she gave birth and was then executed with the rest. Um, additionally, the rest um, who had been sentenced to death were hung. These, uh, these were very gruesome deaths for, for the rebelling slaves and were meant as examples to prevent future rebellions. Um, of course, uh, future rebellions did occur, but it is just one example of how um, whites tried to do public uh, public punishments in order to the uh, in order to allow others who might be thinking of rebelling to see what their fates could be. Um, additionally, stricter laws were enacted to prevent the manumission of, of enslaved people, and um, new laws were also meant to prevent their congregating. Some examples of the new codes um, that were implemented allowed slaveholders to dole out harsher punishments to rebellious slaves as they saw fit. Um, they restricted the ability of the enslaved to gather in groups, prohibited the possession of firearms by enslaved people, and permitted that crimes of property damage, rape, and conspiracy would be punish punishable by um, the death penalty. Um, there were also new requirements that charge a tax of 200 pounds if a slave owner tried to flee tried to free their slave. This meant that the cost of freeing one slave was higher than the cost of purchasing one, 
And this was obviously meant to deter people from freeing their enslaved um, people in order to reduce the population of freed Blacks in the city. Um, because for slaves to see the presence of free Blacks um, was considered to be one of the, the reasons that they sought freedom or that they rebelled. The image that you see on the screen is actually from the slave conspiracy of 1741, um, also a rebellion that took place in New York City. Uh, but it is a good example of what the execution scenes might have looked like for the 1712 slave rebellions as well. So the new restrictions that uh, were implemented after the rebellion would only make the life, life of the enslaved people in the colony of New York even more difficult than it already was and would feed into the white paranoia of Black people. Um, this white paranoia was um, the fear of race riots or race wars provoked by Blacks or other races. Um, as history will prove through some of the other presentations that will be given in this series, white people often fear the same violence that they themselves enacted on Black people. Um, understanding the history of 1619 and 1712 gives us in insight into how this sense of paranoia, white supremacist institutions, and racist ideas about Black people arrived and were maintained and nurtured in the United States. Um, additionally, our exploration of slavery in New York will continue tomorrow with a discussion on the discovery of an African burial ground in Manhattan, and later this week with a brief history of the path to abolition of slavery in New York State. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this topic, I have provided a reference list of sources in the description alongside some of the websites that I had spoken to prior. Um, and my bibliography will also be available on the Nehoff website so that you can check out any of the sources that I used um, for the creation of this presentation. While you're in the description checking out the source links, I will also invite you to fill out a quick survey that is also linked in the video description and that will help us gather feedback about this specific topic. The survey will take you no more than five minutes and will provide us with valuable information that will help us in the formation of future presentations like this one. Lastly, should you have any questions regarding the presentation itself, you can always email me at the link at, the, at my email that I have provided on the screen. Um, and also please do reach out to Nehoff with any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work, Nehoff's contact information is also available on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining me on this educational journey and for joining me on the opening presentation for the Black History Matter series. I hope to see you in future presentations. Thank you.